Well, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, John Lindley uh, from Public Affairs Associates, the MICPA's uh, public policy legislative affairs lobbying firm in, in Lansing. Uh, for those who don't know me, as Bob uh, probably said in my introduction, I've been a part of the MICPA family for, for a long time now, and I'm very happy to be there. This is, believe it or not, my 20th Spring Members Advisory Symposium with the MICPA. Actually, let me take a step back and first say that um, if you see my eyes going down through this presentation, it's no secret that obviously I'm consulting with my notes and my outline for this presentation. So um, I want to be conscious of, of trying to look at you in the virtual eyes, so to speak, um, as if I was standing on a stage. But I do have to consult my notes from time to time. Um, as I said, this is my, my 20th Spring Members Advisory Symposium with the MICPA. But, uh, first, uh, back then, we called it uh, Spring Regional Advisory Council for those watching this who, who may remember that. And this profession and this association has, has been a part of my life now for almost as long as it had not been a part of my life and truly has, has shaped me as a professional. And I, I, so I thank you. I thank you for that. And I wanted to take an opportunity to do so. Um, it was my second such event, um, actually a fall Regional Advisory Council, as it was called back then, um, where you gathered at the Lansing Center in, in Lansing on a, an absolutely gorgeous day uh, for a program much like what you're watching um, virtually right now. And uh, we had some meetings scheduled uh, in the Capitol with members, lawmakers, members of the House and the Senate on that day. Um, and then we, we all watched in horror as our, our lives changed forever and those planes crashed into the uh, the Twin Towers in New York and the Pentagon in Washington, that, that field in, in Pennsylvania. And we all wondered if our lives would, would ever be the same again. Um, and to a certain extent, they weren't. And, and now here we sit again, almost 20 years later, um, again, in, in unique circumstances, um, with a, a generational defining moment without any question. And I wanted to take a moment just to, to say that I have the benefit of working with a number of associations. Um, my firm, Public Affairs Associates, beyond the MICPA, we represent other member-driven associations, uh, recreational vehicles, campgrounds, manufactured housing, uh, chiropractors, uh, nursing homes, funeral directors, and, and, and others. And I can tell you that over these last uh, seven to eight weeks, associations have been doing a, a great job at providing member value but none better than what the MICPA has been doing. I've had the benefit of working closely with Bob and Rachel and other members of the team these past few weeks. And there's no question about my mind that they're doing everything as well, if not better than any other professional member driven association in this state. And um, from an outsider's standpoint, I think it's important that everybody knows that and recognizes that as I'm sure you do. I, uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time today talking about federal or state uh, legislation. There's, first of all, not much at the state level uh, to talk about. And at the federal level, outside of the, the stimulus packages, the CARES Act and its, its predecessor and others, um, you know, there's plenty has been written and analyzed and, and, and you as CPAs, of course, have, have been a huge part of that. So I'm not going to sit here and assume that there's anything I could tell you about those uh, policy matters that, that you don't already know and, and, and potentially know uh, better than me. Um, so instead, I'm, I'm going to focus on, on what lies ahead here in Michigan and, and a little bit of what lies ahead um, at the federal level. So Lansing's current focus, um, and when I say Lansing, I, I mean both the administration and the, and the legislative branch government, Lansing's current focus just started this week. They began in the House of Representatives to have some uh, legislative hearings on some matters that are of a non-COVID-19 uh, uh, foundation. Uh, you've, you've seen a couple of things, of course, timely matters that the legislature feels needs to, to be addressed uh, with some level of urgency, but only just started this week um, taking a look at and addressing anything that was, was unrelated to the, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The vast majority, 99% of the focus of what's going on in Lansing right now is in two buckets, uh, COVID-19 response, um, what's going on with, with the state level's response to that, of course, and then um, the budget, the state budget and what the implications are uh, relative to, this, to the state budget. Unlike the federal government, of course, we all know that here in Michigan, there's a constitutional requirement to pass a balanced budget. 
every year. Um, further, there's a statutory requirement that that budget has to be balanced um, and passed by July 1st of every year. That's somewhat of a, a new requirement. So relative to the COVID-19 response and what the state has been doing there, of course, you've got all of the executive orders that the governor has been issuing. And then you've got a lot of what the legislature has been doing uh, relative to their response to that. And that gets into one of the other things we're going to talk about a little later, which is the, the political web that is, is spun around um, all of this, the, the entire thing and the, the struggle uh, for power and the, the balance of power that's going on. Uh, but let's talk about the, the, the other bucket right now really quickly, which is the state budget. On May 15th, the next uh, state revenue consensus revenue estimating conference is going to be taking place in, in Lansing. That is when the House Fiscal Agency and the Senate Fiscal Agency get together and come to an agreement on numbers relative to the state's revenue flow. Um, there'll be two, uh, not to oversimplify things, but two numbers that come out of that revenue estimating conference on the 15th. One are revenue estimates associated with the remainder of the current fiscal year that we're in right now, the 2019-2020 uh, fiscal year, which ends on September 30th. Uh, and then numbers associated with where uh, revenues are projected to be for uh, the coming fiscal year, the fiscal year that begins on October 1st, which is the budget that is being developed from the, from the ground up right now. So again, two numbers, uh, estimated projections and revenue loss associated with what remains of the current fiscal year and revenue estimates for what uh, is to come in the coming fiscal year. Right now, although the final numbers will be uh, issued on the 15th for those estimates, right now for the current fiscal year, for the remaining months of the current fiscal, fiscal year, what we're hearing is that there's going to be someplace between a two and a three and a half billion dollar revenue shortfall for the remaining months of the fiscal year. Uh, for next fiscal year, again, that begins on October 1st, the budget that they'll begin developing right now from the ground up, uh, estimates are, are even higher, as you can probably imagine, more in the three to four billion dollar range. So uh, what we're talking about here is over an 18 month period of time, roughly for the state government in the state of Michigan, budget uh, projections for, for revenue shortfall is going to be someplace in the seven to seven and a half billion dollar range. Now, I believe it's important for people to understand and have the context here. When, when, uh, when you look at the state's uh, annual operating budget, many people will see a, an annual operating budget that varies someplace between 55 and $60 billion roughly, and, and to cut $3 billion out of that number, most people would say, well, that's not as big of a deal as, as what is being reported in the media. Uh, for example, uh, trying to cut three, four, two and a half, whatever that number is, billion out of 60 billion. But the truth of the matter is that the vast majority of those dollars, that $60 billion, is constitutionally required earmarked spending or federal flow through dollars to the extent that what we're actually talking about here in discretionary spending is more in the range of 10 to $11 billion. So when you say cut three, cut three and a half billion, it's not out of 60, it's cutting that out 10 or 11. And those are, are, are obviously very deep and very impactful cuts that the legislature and the administration is going to have to be taking a look at over coming weeks. Just to give you an idea of what the impact could be, for example, there, the state government could cut, could eliminate, totally eliminate 12 entire departments from state government. Departments like the Department of Civil Rights, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Environmental Quality, for example, 12 entire departments from state government could be eliminated by the legislature and the administration through the budget process. And that number would still not reach $3 billion in cuts. Um, the other side of, of the token here is, is the school aid fund, uh, K-12 funding throughout the state of Michigan, which as you know, has multiple revenue sources, but a huge portion of that is through sales tax revenue in the state. So a large portion of those cuts, those numbers that I talked about are in the K-12 budget, not just in the general fund budget. You may have seen something in, in recent weeks uh, in, in media reports relative to what they're projecting for per pupil funding cuts uh, to the foundation allowance in the state of Michigan in the, in the range of 500 to $1,000 per pupil um, cut uh, in the current fiscal year, um, where the schools are already 10 months into their fiscal year. 
Um, that would be for uh, the vast majority of school districts across the state, um, with very few exceptions, uh, a cut of such devastating size that it's hard to, to imagine how, how it would be how it would be absorbed uh, through those last months. The rainy day fund is, is the, the budget stabilization fund. A rainy day fund is a, another place where a lot of people look to to try and, and come up with a, a solution to these budget stabilization issues. And uh, the truth is, I believe there's, there's one to $1.2 billion in that budget stabilization fund, a uh, rainy day fund, which is a great number, is a number that has been added to uh, by the prior and current administration over time uh, to, to increase the state's uh, credit uh, score and all the above. But uh, in their infinite wisdom, during better times, the legislature passed statutes related and put in place uh, restrictions on how much can at one time be uh, brought out of the budget stabilization fund. So best case scenario, you're taking money out of the budget stabilization fund in, in um, $250 million increments, uh, which as you can imagine is a, a amount of money that I would never be able to accurately wrap my arms around and, and understand that amount of money. But $250 million when you are trying to find $7 billion is uh, not something that's, that's really going to help you solve the problem uh, very much at all. Uh, further, people ask about revenue enhancements and whether it's possible that the other side of the ledger could be adjusted where we bring in more revenue to the state uh, than what's currently being brought in. Uh, that gets me um, somewhat into the conversation relative to the, the political aspects of things, which you know, the short answer to that is no, this legislature is not going to pass any level of a tax increase, certainly between now and the end of the, the, the calendar year this year, uh, November, when the, when the election takes place. You're not going to see an increase in income tax. You're not going to see an increase in different um, business-related taxes. That's not going to happen this year. Um, because of speaking with, with, with CPAs at this point in time, you'll understand that you may see under the umbrella of current law, you may see interpretations by the Department of Treasury and other departments there will be a mindset of revenue maximization from the Department of Treasury um, in moving forward, where there is gray area to side with either the taxpayer or to side with uh, the state of Michigan from a revenue standpoint. You will, if you haven't already, see a paradigm switch in mindset uh, to a, a state of revenue maximization by the state of Michigan. This is something that's not new to, I'm sure, many of the people that are, are listening to this uh, today. We, we saw that during uh, not the prior administration, but the prior administration uh, to that one um, relative to the positions that they take on those areas that do have some area of ambiguity uh, related to tax policy and otherwise. And you will see a switch there, I have no doubt in my mind. But relative to legislation to increase taxes or graduated income tax or something along the lines in the state of Michigan, you will, you will not see anything along those lines, certainly between now and the end of the calendar year. Federal stimulus dollars is the other place where help can come to solve these budget deficits that we're talking about right now. And there's been, again, a lot of media attention and conversations over the course of the last week relative to whether or not the federal government is going to come to the aid of the state governments and local governments when they now need to balance their budgets and are facing uh, budget deficits of huge size. Interestingly, Michigan, um, in a report that I read this morning from Moody's, is unfortunately uh, has two distinctions that, that I don't think anybody wants. Uh, number one, uh, Michigan ranks uh, 50 out of 50th relative to uh, per capita job loss. Uh, as a result of this. And then uh, the other one is Michigan ranks 50th out of 50 relative to uh, projected revenue impact um, to, the, to the state of Michigan between locals and, and state governments uh, as a result of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I don't have any doubt in my mind that this budget deficit that we've been speaking about is going to require some level of intervention by the federal government. To date, the federal government, through the stimulus uh, in direct uh, dollars to, to the state government, ha has provided Michigan uh, with someplace between three and four billion dollars in aid. 
Now that aid, as you know, came with uh, certain restrictions on what that money can be spent for. Um, the two biggest, again, not to oversimplify things, but the two biggest restrictions are A, that money cannot be used for something that was previously funded by the state government. And B, it has to be used for something that is COVID-19 related. What the state and states all across the country need now are money from the federal government that comes with little or no restrictions so that they can begin to use those resources to balance their budgets, uh, to, to try to soften the cuts that will be made in some of the areas that I talked about before, such as per pupil funding. Now, whether or not that is ultimately going to happen or not, and how restrictive those dollars are going to be, it, it remains to be seen. It certainly is going to be more of a fight in Congress, in the U.S. Congress, the House, and the Senate, than what some of the prior stimulus packages ha have been. It's not going to happen as quickly, and it is going to be more of a fight. I've had more than one conversation, however, with members of the U.S. House, um, Congress members, in the last couple of weeks where they somewhat anecdotally said, look, John, we're going to keep printing money until we don't have to print money anymore to get the country out of this mess. Um, people have difference of opinion on whether or not that's a good thing or whether or not, that, not that's a bad thing. But I have a feeling that we're at the state in the state of Michigan where if the federal government was to say, here you go, we're going to give you $5 billion to help you with that $7 billion problem then even the most uh, considerable conservative budget hawks are not going to say no thank you at this point in time just because of the depth of the issue that we have. I have been wrong before and I may be proven wrong again, but I believe there's gonna to have to be some balance uh, there related to federal dollars involved in this. So that gets us to uh, really the, the web of things that has been wound again, uh, the shadow that's cast over all of this COVID response, budget issues, and all of the above, which is the fact that we have a, an election coming uh, this November. People, many, have to uh, reapply for their jobs in this country and in this state on the ballot. And the decisions that they're made, uh, made right now are under a tremendous amount of scrutiny uh, with, with the election coming. Um, and that, that has an effect on, on all of those issues. Budget, and policy that, that we've been talking about. So let's start by taking a look at, at who's on or, and who's not on the ballot uh, come this November, uh, we, both of, of which are noteworthy. Obviously at the top, um, you've, you've got the president and vice president uh, on the ballot, um, President Trump, Vice President Pence, um, and uh, uh, the presumed Democratic nominee at this point in time, former Vice President Joe Biden, um, will be obviously running against each other with a, a yet to be a determined um, Democratic vice presidential candidate. United States Senate race here in Michigan uh, this year, United States Senator Gary Peters um, is, is trying to earn another six year term in the, in the US Senate. Um, and he is running again, a, a yet to be determined Republican candidate, but the presumed Republican nominee, the one who has all of the endorsements and all of the money is um, uh, John James. Um, who ran against United States Senator Debbie Stabenow two years ago, performed, uh, although in loss, performed so well against Senator Stabenow that um, he, he earned a spot among Republicans uh, back on the ballot this time in, in taking on Gary Peters. All members of the United States House of Representatives from Michigan, U.S. Congressmen and women are on the ballot um, this time around, and we'll take a, a deeper dive into that in a second. And then, of course, the, uh, the State House of Representatives. Of note, who's not on the ballot are the constitutional offices here in Michigan. So the governor, the attorney general, the secretary of state are not on the ballot until 2022, uh, as well as the state Senate, the 38 members of the state Senate. Um, this is a midterm uh, for them. So the, none of those members are on, on the ballot either at this point in time. So let's talk a little bit about um, the, the, some of the congressional races. So right now the makeup for, for Michigan's congressional seats, the 14, there are six Republicans, one libertarian in, in Justin Amash, who, who used to be in, in the Republican caucus, and seven Democrats among those members. For uh, the most part, we do not see anything um, surprising or funny happening in the vast majority of those congressional races. There are two 
open seats among those that I just described. And the third congressional uh, seat on the west side of the state, Congressman Justin Amash, as many of you know, has, has chosen, not only is he not a Republican anymore, Republican anymore, he's a libertarian, he's not caucusing with the Republicans, he's also decided not to run uh, for Congress uh, in that seat again, uh, that was uh, you know official some time ago, um, and has yet has also formed a, a, an exploratory committee for uh, President of the United States. Uh, now, what that means is uh, good things for the Republicans in that seat. The third congressional district in Michigan is one that has has evolved a little bit relative to the numbers. So, for example, Trump won that seat with 52 percent of the vote in 2016. Now, most people would think that that West Michigan, Grand Rapids area, that um, any Republican is going to perform a lot better um, than 52%. But the the suburban uh, areas around Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids itself, and some of the outlying areas are not as conservative as they uh, were at one point in time. Having Justin Amash continue to be on the Republican ticket for Congress in that seat would divide the vote. It would divide the vote if he was running as a libertarian um, against a Republican, and it could potentially make room for a Democrat to win in that congressional seat. However, since he is not running for that congressional seat uh, as a libertarian, he's not running for that congressional seat at all, that helps the Republican, the, the ultimate Republican nominee in that seat, probably keep it in, in Republican hands. It's really down to two people in that race for the Republican nomination and what I believe ultimately will be the person who, who wins that congressional seat. Uh, number one is, is a gentleman by the name of Peter Meyer, um, the last name being Meyer. His grandfather, of course, was the, the retail giant uh, Hank Meyer uh, in the state. And then uh, State Representative Lynn Affendoulis, uh, somebody who's not unfamiliar to many of the people that are watching this. Um, Lynn is cousins with our very own former State Representative Chris Affendoulis, a CPA who, uh, who, who served uh, in the House with distinction for, for a number of years um, as a CPA. Lynn is the chair of the State Tax Committee uh, in the House of Representatives. And, and the race has really come down to those two individuals. Um, obviously, Mr. Meyer is very well funded and has a lot of endorsements in, in that race, but so does uh, State Representative uh, Lynn Affendoulis as well. So um, the poll numbers seem to be swaying at, at this moment to, to uh, Meyer, uh, but that remains to be seen ultimately. I, I think that the person who wins that race will win the, win the nomination. The other congressional seat that is open uh, is the 10th congressional seat on the east side of the state. Um, that's currently held by Congressman Paul Mitchell. He is elected not to uh, return or, or run to return to Congress this year. And uh, again, that is a very heavy Republican area. We believe that the Republican nominee who wins the Republican nomination in the primary will, will become the next member of Congress from, from that particular district. Um, and that race has also come down to, uh, we believe, essentially two front runners in that primary. Number one is the current chair of the State House Representatives uh, Appropriations Committee, a representative and chairman Shane Hernandez from St. Clair Shores. Um, he very well could be uh, that nominate. And he's running against retired Brigadier General uh, Doug Slocum, uh, again, from the east side of the state. This is, is largely... Um, uh, and this is this is largely Trump territory, without any question. Uh, Macomb County, areas of Lapeer County, and otherwise, um, this is this is is Trump territory, and um, this is a race uh, between a couple of of well known individuals in that district to uh, endear themselves to the president, and um, uh, ultimately one will will rise above the other in that primary and become the next congressman from that district. Outside of the two open seats, though. Uh, I don't anticipate there being any surprises in, in the remaining 12 members of, of the congressional delegation from here in Michigan. Um, the State House of Representatives uh, may be a little bit different situation. So the State House of Representatives is composed of 110 members here in the state of Michigan, currently 58 Republicans and 51 Democrats. We have one vacancy. Um, sadly, as you may have read, uh, State Representative Isaac Robinson from the city of Detroit passed away last month, actually, due to COVID-19. Um, and so his seat is, is vacant and will remain vacant until November. So again, 58 Republicans, 
and 51 Democrats in the state of Michigan. Now I'm going to use some round numbers here um, to describe the balance of power. They're, they're estimates, but they're, they're pretty pretty close, uh, which is to say that that 45 of those 110 seats are solidly Republican to the extent that um, whomever the Republican is that's running for state house in that district is going to win. Similarly, 45 of those seats are solidly Democratic to the extent that whomever the Democratic nominee is uh, in November is going to win that race uh, for state house of representatives. So that really leaves 20 out of the 110 seats in the house of representatives that are close enough in their base percentages that the Republican or the Democrat could win. And that's where the balance of power for, for the state house of representatives comes into play. Um, between US Congress, US Senate, President, State House, I believe that, that the, the greatest chance for there to be a, a paradigm switch in power is going to be in, in the State House of Representatives. The numbers might seem large um, for the Democrats to, to win uh, six, seven, eight seats um, that are currently held by Republicans in that seat, but because of term limits, a lot of seats are open. They don't have an incumbent running in them that have been safely in Republican hands in, in the past that, that could ultimately be won by the Democrat. For a long time, this, this November's election was going to be about really one thing, a single issue, uh, which is either you as a candidate are uh, supportive of President Trump and that which he stands for, or you as a candidate are not and are, are anti-President Trump. And that is a, a defined, uh, consistent position that, that leaves very little room for, for gray area. And that uh, defining of candidates was going to be something then that carried its way all the way down the ticket uh, come November. And even with this global health pandemic that has, has taken grips on our, on our country, um, that essentially remains exactly true to this day. Um, there are some nuances there, um, but for, we're supportive of President Trump uh, in January, are supportive of President Trump now, and those who weren't supportive of, of President Trump in January are not any more now than what they were. Um, and this election is, is more or less going to be about uh, that very thing all the way down the ticket. There might be some nuance there because of the health pandemic, where you may have, and I'll give a couple of examples, you may have uh, healthcare workers, frontline healthcare workers, that were inclined to be supportive of President Trump uh, previous to the pandemic, but no longer are because they're critical of his response to what took place. Likewise, you may have um, small business owners in the state of Michigan who were inclined not to support President Trump, but because of the president's focus on, on returning the, the economy to normal and traditional operations, um, have now become more supportive of the, of the current administration. But beyond some very, very small nuance, I believe that this election will remain exactly about this very little gray area, as we all know, in, the, in that uh, conversation relative to are you, are you with the president or are you not with the president? And I believe that that will trickle down and cascade down all the way down uh, to the ticket. Interestingly, it's important, as I talked about before, the Governor Whitmer is not on the, on the ballot this, this November. So a vote against Governor Whitmer, how will that come? How will that, will, the, will a vote against Governor Whitmer be translated in, in the presidential race uh, or will it not be translated in the presidential race? Because of that clear, what I believe to be a clear division, I believe there to be very few undecided voters in this country. This election is going to be almost solely about turnout. Who is going to turn out more in November, the Republicans or the Democrats? And a lot of what we're seeing right now in policy and in budget is completely related to motivating those political bases to turn out in November. And when I say turnout, I want to give you an example. Democrats in this state, for example, they do not need to turn out in numbers like they did in 2008 when, when President Obama was first elected. They don't even need to turn out in numbers like they did in 2012 
for President Obama's second term. They just can't turn out in 2016 numbers. They need to do better than that. And if that turnout is anywhere near what, what, what it's projected to be or near 2012 numbers, then it's going to be very difficult for uh, President Trump to win this state. It's going to be very difficult for some of those open seats in the House of Representatives in the state house that I've talked about to stay in Republican hands. That Democratic turnout in different parts of the state and in some of the more populous areas of the state uh, could could make a, a, a strong uh, switch in, in some of the, the balance of powers that we have politically here in the country. Similarly, along the same lines, if Republicans turn out in, in huge numbers, like we've seen across the country in some of the, the special elections, we've seen Republican turnout um, like we've never seen before. If we, if we see big numbers of Republican turnout and motivation uh, coupled with uh, perhaps lackluster Democratic numbers, then you're very well going to see um, a consistent Republican wins up and down the ballot uh, come this November. But, but that, over the next few weeks and over the next few months, is largely what you're going to see driving the policy and the budget implications that we talked about earlier dur during this, this uh, webcast. So because this election is going to be so uh, largely based on, on turnout on both sides of the, of the aisle, what you're going to see in the next six to eight weeks and what you're going to see in, in the next four to five months are going to be policy and budget decisions that are going to be largely based on a desire to motivate political base on both sides of the aisle. I'm going to give a couple examples just to illustrate this, but I want to make sure everybody understands that this is by no means uh, me uh, offering any commentary on these particular issues. I'm just using them as an example. So um, you will see, although Governor Whitmer would never sign a piece of legislation in the state of Michigan that were to restrict women's health care access or were to make it easier to uh, purchase and carry firearms in the state of Michigan, the Democratic governor, Governor Whitmer, would never sign any piece of legislation that were to fall into either of those two buckets. However, you will see the Republican House of Representatives and the Republican State Senate in the state of Michigan pass pieces of legislation that fall into those buckets and pass them to her desk, um, knowing that they won't become law, but because those efforts are what motivates the political base uh, in their districts back home. Similarly, another example, um, and I talked about this a little bit before, um, the Republican House and the Republican Senate in the state of Michigan is not, especially during the election year, going to entertain any efforts to increase taxes. They're not going to entertain an effort to imposition a graduated income tax at the state level here in, in Michigan, as an example but you will see Democrats make efforts to do that. They will introduce legislation and they will stand at the proverbial uh, uh, you know, podium to, to fight for those causes, knowing very well that it won't happen and it can't happen here in the state of Michigan. But they're doing that because they need to motivate uh, their bases back home in the district to come out and vote for them come November. You'll see that continue through the budget process and through the policy process uh, over the course of, again, over the next few weeks and next few months, that's just a, a big part of, of what's going to be the driving force behind a lot of the policy decisions uh, that we see made over the course of the next, uh, the next uh, couple months. So um, all of that said, rest assured, uh, please, everybody rest assured that, that your team at the MICPA, uh, your board of directors, your legislative advisory group, your political action committee, um, Bob Doyle and, and the entire staff, Rachel, um, and then myself and, and the team at PAA here in, in Lansing remain 100% committed as we always have been to um, protecting and advancing the, the integrity of the CPA here in the state of Michigan and doing all that we can to make sure that the, the profession continues uh, to be viewed in, in such a, a positive light, both here and, and nationwide. Um, and doing our part uh, uh, in moving forward. 
my understanding is that there is the ability for you to uh, ask questions about my presentation. You just do so by um, uh, the mechanisms that the MICPA has set forward. They will forward those questions on to me and then I will answer them in due time. So I hope you find these remarks interesting and I hope that you and all of those who you love are safe and healthy.